Today, let's do a brief overview of a very important general concept known as network externalities. The basic idea here is that the value of a good or service increases the more people use it. So, for instance, if you're the only person in the world with a telephone, it's not actually worth very much. The more that other people have phones, the more people you have to call and text. When it comes to other tech standards, however, this issue can take many different and often subtle forms. Let's consider some other examples from the world of media. For instance, there's the question of whether you have the right kind of TV to receive the signal that's being sent out for other TV owners. For instance, digital versus non-digital. Network externalities also arise when we consider different kinds of TV interfaces. For instance, your TV has to connect to a DVD player, but this requires some standardization of the system. Sony versus Betamax during the early years of watching movies on tape. More recently, HD DVD versus Blu-ray. If you have a Blu-ray player, that's worth a lot more if a lot of other people are using the same system. A lot of web companies rely directly or indirectly on network externalities. For instance, if we consider Facebook, it's useful precisely because so many other people are on the system. eBay is useful as a general medium for buying and selling goods, and Amazon is useful in part because that's the place where a lot of other people leave their reader reviews. Finally, a lot of Internet protocols rely a lot of people using similar systems or adopting similar practices. To consider three distinct issues associated with network externalities. First is, there is a potential market failure simply because the network is too small. That is, not enough people are buying phones or using some other common system simply because they don't necessarily take into account the benefits that this produces for other people. This isn't usually a major policy issue because these networks do tend to grow in due time, but nonetheless it's one very simple way of thinking about why network externalities are an important issue. Another general problem is that you can be stuck in the wrong network and thus it can be hard to coordinate a switch. So again, if we think of the early days of Blu-ray, a lot of people preferred Blu-ray discs to DVDs, but it wasn't always easy to get Blu-rays until a lot of other people were in the system. These switches do usually take place over time, or they take place in the appropriate partial manner. As with Blu-rays, plenty of people still watch DVDs, but still there can be delays and coordination costs in settling upon the right answer. A third issue with network externalities, and here we're getting closer to the world of policy, is that there is a problem of monopoly if the standard is privately owned. And here we need to draw a distinction between networks which are based in a proprietary element and networks which are based in a non-proprietary element. A simple example of a non-proprietary network would be a language. Of course, there are very real gains when you have large numbers of people using the same language. Yet you don't have to worry about that language being owned. You can use a word from that language and others will understand you, and you don't have to pay something to the owner of that word. It's a free and open system. An example of a proprietary network with some monopoly power, enforced by regulation, I might add, would be the early days of the telephone in the United States, where AT&T had a virtual lock on many parts of the system. You may think that proprietary networks are always worse, but that in general isn't true. For one thing, a network which has an ownership component, there's a greater incentive to invest in that network and to upgrade it, but of course there's also the problem that the monopoly power may lead to higher prices or some people being excluded from network participation. Sometimes with proprietary networks, there's also an issue of what is called excess momentum. Excess momentum means that in these cases, there's an incentive to invest too much in innovation because the person who captures the market standard earns high profits and has a good deal of control over market conditions. For instance, if your company can become the next Facebook, well, that's worth a great deal of money, and we may end up with too much in the way of resources scrambling after these prizes. There's a related issue that if you're switching networks too frequently, you can end up leaving the older users, users somewhat stranded. A possible example of that is all those people who are still on the network MySpace rather than Facebook. 
Note further that excess momentum is unlikely to be an issue with non-proprietary networks. There's simply no firm or institution which has a big profit incentive to try to switch everyone onto the next system. But that, of course, is also another reason why the proprietary networks are at least sometimes better. Namely, they often have stronger incentives to find and implement innovations, even if those incentives are sometimes a bit too strong. If you're a company and you're trying to establish your product or standard as the dominant one in the market, you may behave in some ways which maybe at first glance would look unusual. For instance, sometimes it's better to give away a standard or parts of a standard or a standard in its early days to give it away for free to help it establish a market foothold as being the dominant standard. That would mean, for instance, that those early Blu-ray players probably were not sold at a maximum price. The purpose was to get enough people interested so that in the long run, Blu-ray is seen as the thing to buy, and thus you're trying to lock in the market. This is sometimes called penetration, penetration pricing. That is, relative to what you might charge, the price in early periods starts off being rather low, and then later on the price may go up as you have a firmer and more established market base. Of course, customers don't want to be locked into a system or standard where they know they'll have to end up paying monopoly prices. So very often a supplier will, in the early days of fighting for a market position, pre-commit to relative openness by licensing the product. Again, think of the Blu-ray players. It's probably not a successful strategy to try to use IP law and insist that only your company have the right to make Blu-ray players. Customers then probably wouldn't want to buy them. So instead, the standard spreads through the market, and like today, we have a lot of different companies manufacturing players which meet that standard. There are many policy issues involved with network externalities, and I would just stress how diverse this issue really is. I'm giving a very broad overview, but the exact analysis will depend on which sector, which network, and which details you're talking about. But some general issues which come up. One, as I've already mentioned, is simply the degree of property rights over the network standard and what are the IP issues. What should the law be aiming for? To strengthen market power or to relax market power? And if it's to relax it, well, exactly how much? Again, what you want is broad accessibility, but without damaging too much the incentive to innovate. When deciding how strictly the network property rights should be enforced, very often we're trading off the costs of monopoly power versus the costs of neglect of network, because as I've mentioned, networks which are completely non-proprietary often change more slowly, or there are fewer investment upgrades in those networks. There's also the general issue of how to regulate the monopolist overseeing a network. This is very important with a lot of internet protocols, such as domain names. And in general, what can be done, even when there's no direct government involvement, but how can we encourage industry standards and standardization in a relatively competitive setting without those companies having to violate antitrust law? So those are just a few of the core issues which arise in many network externality settings. There's a great deal of important and also very interesting research on these topics. Of course, you can just Google network externalities, but I'd also recommend the writings of these researchers who are all very well known in the economics profession. You can check them out on Google, but also use scholar.google.com and sometimes put in phrases like network externalities as well. And finally, you can follow up on all of these areas by pursuing particular issues and disaggregating the notion of network externalities down to more details.